Welcome to this TMDL public meeting for Arrowhead Pond. My name is Jeff Berkus. I am the TMDL program lead. You'll also be hearing from Andrew Frana, who is this uh, project lead for Arrowhead Pond. A couple things up top. There is a public notice period that is running now through October 5th. What that means is if you would like to make an official public comment, you'll need to email that to me by October 5th at the email address shown there. It's Jeff dot Berkus at dnr.iowa.gov. If you have any more just technical questions or uh, want to talk about the document a little bit more but don't want to make an official public comment, I'd encourage you to reach out to Andrew Frana and his email address can be uh, seen on the screen there as well and it's andrew.frana at dnr.iowa.gov. So I want to start off and I just want to talk about a couple of terms that Andrew is going to use throughout the presentation or you might encounter them on the document that's on our website. The first term that you're gonna come across is watershed. It's very important to the work that we do and I wanna make sure that we have a pretty good understanding of what a watershed is before we go any further. And so to help us do that, I pulled a screenshot of a map that we are gonna show here in a little bit uh, and also will be found on that document on the website. So this is an aerial view of the vicinity of Arrowhead Pond and Pottawatomie County. And the important thing to note here is that this dark outline that I'm using my cursor to go around and everything inside of it that's a little bit darker of a color, that is the watershed for Arrowhead Pond. And what that means is that all of the land here will drain into a common place, Arrowhead Pond. And so the way that I like to think about watershed is that if a drop of water lands anywhere outside of that darkened area, it's gonna go somewhere else. It's going to go to a different watershed. But if a drop of water lands inside of that darkened line, it's going to eventually wind up in Arrowhead Pond and it is landing in that Arrowhead Pond watershed. A couple other things to note, anytime we show a map, again, in this presentation or in the document, there's going to be a couple of important things to note. You wanna take a look at the compass rows. That'll always give you the north direction. Generally, it's always just gonna be pointing up on our map maps. Uh, we have a scale down here to give you an idea of how far things are from each other. We'll have an inset map of the state of Iowa with the county boundaries. As you see here, uh, Pottawatomie County is darkened with the circle approximating where Arrowhead Pond is. And then we'll have a legend here for anything that you might need to know about that specific map. So that dark outline there indicates watershed boundary. This kind of gold line here indicates public land. So that would be the park that surrounds Arrowhead Pond. Another map that you might see is a little, this is a little bit closer view of that watershed. So we still have that darkened outline. So this is still the watershed for Arrowhead Pond, uh, but we see we got a lot of different colors going in here. So what you wanna do is you wanna come over to this legend. You wanna say, well, what is this yellow and brown crosshatch? Well, that indicates from uh, our reconnaissance that uh, this is land that's used for row crop. And I say, okay, well, what's this purple color? That's, that's pasture land. And so this legend here is going to be very useful in determining what it is that we're trying to get across by using a map like this. It's very colorful, um, but it's also very informative. The next map is a little bit closer. And so we're really zooming in here on Arrowhead Pond itself. And we still have that darker outline that's important. So again, here where my cursor is, is going to be inside of that watershed. So all of the water is going to drain eventually into Arrowhead Pond. Outside of that, that's gonna go somewhere else. But we're in closer, so we're not seeing the entire watershed here. We are just focusing in on the pond itself. And uh, we will do that for purposes of showing where like monitoring locations are, which is what this particular one is here. The next term that I want to talk about is impairment. It's something that we'll talk about a lot. And basically an impairment is anytime uh, we are not seeing water quality expectations met in a particular water body. So we have these things called water quality standards, which is basically a set of uh, expectations for that particular lake or stream. And then we take monitoring information and we compare it against those expectations. And when our information shows that 
there's uh, something that's not being met, an expectation that's not being met, uh, that is an impairment. And that will go on to the impaired waters list, which we do for all waters of the state. And um, our job is to go into those uh, watersheds and figure out what's going on. So we'll get into that here a little bit. Another term that you'll hear is point and non-point source pollution. And so we'll handle those terms together. Point source pollution is, is anything that requires a permit that is a, a permitted release of water that has a pollutant in it. Um, that, and a lot of people like to say you can point to it, like say it's coming out of a pipe. Um, that's a pretty good shorthand, but I think that the, the more accurate definition of point source pollution would be anything that is permitted in, in the watershed. Non-point would be everything else. So it would be anything that doesn't require a permit. Uh, it's usually coming in a diffuse manner. Um, say if it rains and you have uh, water that's running off of uh, your lawn or your farm field and it's carrying a, pollu a pollutant with it, that's generally considered a non-point source of pollution. And so important to consider that when we're talking about these things is that in a watershed like this, we don't have any point sources. We are only talking about non-point sources. So those diffuse uh, sources of pollution. And then finally, I wanna talk about TMDL itself. So I used it already up front, describing myself as the TMDL program coordinator and Andrew as the TMDL project manager. And so what is a TMDL exactly? And for me, I really like to use this picture. I think this is the, the best way that I can uh, think about it. Uh, it stands officially for total maximum daily load. And I like this picture. It's got, it reminds me of a very uh, much more of a shorthand way to think about this is the tipping point. And so if you think about this pack mule here and think about him with no boxes on this cart. And so he's able to run around and move that cart with ease and it's not a problem for him. We put a, a box on there, we put two boxes on there and he can still move around. It's getting a little harder for him to do that, but more boxes we put on that cart, the harder it is for that pack mule to move around. Eventually, uh, we put so many boxes onto this cart that not only can he not move, but he's up in the air. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out how many boxes of, uh, uh, that we need to take off this cart to put him down but we're doing that for the lake. And so if we wanna think about this as the lake as the pack mule and the boxes here as containing pollutant, think of that as the same thing. If you put one box or two boxes of pollutant into the water, it's gonna be fine. Um, but as we put more and more boxes of pollution into the water, it's going to not meet our expectations and not going to be able to do the work that we expect it to, to the point where it's up in the air and it's not doing anything. And so our job is to come in and try to figure out what is that tipping point? How many of these boxes of pollution do we need to pull off of the cart or out of the lake for this, uh, for this pack mule to get back on the ground and be able to do work? So that's kind of how I like to think of it. Uh, the TMDL is also, in ex uh, we also exchange that term for the math, but also the document. And so uh, that's something to keep in mind is that we are very specifically talking about a TMDL as an equation and as a number that we are presenting to try to make sure that we're able to get down to. But it also shorthand references the document a lot of times. And so what we want to make sure that we're stressing is that the TMDL plus the implementation plan, which is inside of the document, those two things together create what we call a water quality improvement plan. Sometimes we will use the term TMDL with water quality improvement plan interchangeably, but um, just wanna make sure that we all know that TMDL stands for the number and also the document. And you'll see on the front of the document that it says water quality improvement plan. And then again, just think of this going forward when Andrew's gonna be talking about this as the tipping point, if that helps uh, make things easier to understand going forward. Then I just wanted to show one screen that I saw that Andrew was gonna share this, and I, and I think this is a really important slide. Anytime that you see information like this, there's a lot to take in. And so Andrew's, uh, I'm sure he's gonna do a good job of, of slowing down and making sure that he explains everything on here. But if you don't catch it the first time, the, the, the beauty of recording these presentations on video is that you can pause and you can look at this uh, graph until you understand it. You can do the same thing with the maps. 
You could rewind and listen to Andrew's ex explanation again. Um, all of that is going to be important for understanding the information presented here. And of course, um, everything that's presented here is from the document that's on our website. And so, you know, for me, if I'm looking at this, you know, I'm gonna see, well, what is it that we're trying to chart on these, on these axes? And so here I'm seeing TSI values. Well, maybe Andrew will explain in detail what that means, but okay, there's some sort of value that we're plotting here. And then down here is year. I think that's pretty straightforward. And so these dots here are going to tell us something that's related back to um, what's at the top of that, of that graph. And so um, Andrew's gonna do a good job of, of presenting that here in a little bit, but just this is more of me just trying to um, push the idea of, of hitting the pause button and rewinding if we're not catching it the first time, because there's a lot of good information here and stuff like this. And that's it for me. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Andrew, who's gonna take you through the development of this total maximum daily load document. Thanks for that introduction, Jeff. As he said, my name is Andrew Frana, and I am the project lead for Arrowhead Pond. Um, I want to talk about the outline for the rest of the presentation quick. We'll be talking about the water quality improvement plan, and then we'll dive into the description of Arrowhead Pond and its watershed. From there, we'll take a step back and look at the quality, the water quality assessment, and then we'll look at that tipping point or that equation for the TMDL development. And finally, we'll look at steps moving forward for implementation planning or how we can improve the water quality expectations for Arrowhead Pond. So we talked about the uh, various um, sections and parts of the water quality improvement plan. First of all, we need to monitor and assess the water body. We need to figure out if the water body is meeting or not meeting its water quality expectations. And then if it's not, we call that impaired and then from there, we will develop the water quality improvement plan. So if it's impaired, we will look at uh, potential pollutant sources, and then we will have that uh, TMDL calculation, that equation for the tipping point of where uh, the water quality can improve. Um, then we'll talk about implementation planning, list of possible solutions, and BMPs. Next, we'll be at the step where we are today with a public meeting asking for public review and comments of the document. Then we'll go on to future work led by local involvement to implement strategies and practices to improve the water quality. Now what we have here is the bathymetric map of Arrowhead Pond. Um, what that means is it shows the, the various depths. So you can see these contours at two foot depth, six foot, and so on showing how deep it is at any point. Um, fishers and anglers can use this information to find the best fishing spots, you know, where they can park their boats, where they can camp and all of that. So the, uh, a, a couple quick stats about Arrowhead Pond. It was constructed in 1962. Um, its max depth is around 14 feet there at that, uh, the max depth point, uh, that little black circle with the red cross. The average depth across the pond is about 6.1 feet with an area of about 14 acres. Now that's fairly small compared to most lakes in Iowa, but it does share the, uh, the distinction that is also man-made. You can see the uh, dissected arms, which is uh, typical of man-made lakes in Iowa. And the volume is 86 acre feet. So if you can imagine um, 80 acres, an 80 acre field, that's gonna be about one foot depth across that 80 acre field would be the volume of Arrowhead Pond. Now, if we zoom out from the pond itself and look at the water details, um, Jeff explained what the watershed is, but that's just any rainfall that happens within this black boundary here will eventually make its way to Arrowhead Pond. So we wanna, we wanna make sure we look at the land in this watershed because it will impact the water quality in Arrowhead Pond. It's located in uh, Pottawatomie County, about one and a half miles east of the town of Neola, which, uh, pond also flows into Mosquito Creek downstream and the uh, area of the watershed is just over 1,000 acres. So if we look at the the difference between land and water that ratio of how many acres of water is compared to how many acres of land we have a watershed to lake ratio of 74 to 1. Now that means for every one acre of the pond 
there is 74 acres of the watershed. Now that's rather, that's, that's a little bit higher than the uh, typical Iowa watershed to lake ratio. Um, and what we, the, what the document lays out is uh, that that can have a little bit more of an impact on the water quality from the watershed influences. So when we look at uh, best management practices and solutions, we want to pay particular attention to what we can be doing in the watershed. If we look at some of the properties of the watershed, we'll start with uh, the land use assessment. Um, we have various land, land uses in this legend. Row crop with the yellow and brown hatching is nearly 60%. So row crop in this instance means corn and soybeans. So over uh, the assessment period, it can be corn one year and soybeans the next year, but we have a longer assessment period. So we, call, we look at both of those as one. Then we have uh, a couple different types of grassland. We have grazed and ungrazed grass. So grazed would be your pasture where you'd have cattle, horses, things like that. And ungrazed would be CRP, um, vegetated waterways, things like that. Those are all defined in the document as well. And then all others are at about 15%. That can be you know, road, um, the water itself, uh, farmsteads, these red farmstead areas, and then the forest that's closer to Arrowhead Pond. So we go from land use to soil type, what's underneath the land. There are three main soil types. They are Ida, Monona, and Napier. Um, they all are very deep and well-drained and they uh, are formed in the Lus Hills of Iowa. So um, wind-blown sediment is another term for the Lus Hills formations. If we go from soils to slopes or what's happened over time with the soils, we uh, have this. Uh, there's, there's many different classes going from A, B, A through B to F anywhere from 0% slope up to 30% and up. So 0 to 2% is very flat, almost nearly flat, and then F would be very, very steep. Now what we see in Arrowhead Pond watershed is over half of the watershed is either class D or E, which means those slopes are anywhere from 8 or anywhere from 8 to 30%, which is rather steep compared to most Iowa watersheds. Um, what we do see is there's small areas of flat uplands that uh, have narrow veins and steep valleys. So we can see these areas of red in between these valleys um, that show the steep, uh, steep side hill formations. Now, if we look at the uh, combination of land use, soil, and slope distribution, we can see that there may be some uh, issues with erosion in the watershed um, stemming from Large, large amounts of row crop, um, these lust formation soils, and high slopes. So the document lays out that uh, erosion from these different land uses will be key when we look at uh, the water quality analysis and what has been impacting Arrowhead Pond. If we move forward and start to look at the assessment of Arrowhead Pond, you know, what are the issues with Arrowhead Pond? We see two main issues stemming both from water quality. One, there may, at times there are algae issues in the pond, and two, there are turbidity issues. So we'll go forward and we'll talk about what those both mean here in a second. But first, when we talk about monitoring of Arrowhead Pond, we wanna, look, we wanna define that a little bit more. We use the same location, we use that deepest point that we talked about when we looked at the bathymetric map. It's the deepest point there, the same test, so we're always gonna be testing for you know, various nutrient levels, various water clarity levels, um, sometimes bacteria as well. And we're gonna be looking at the same times of the year. So we wanna look at the recreation season from March to November. You know, when people are gonna be using the, uh, the park, we wanna make sure that that's the, uh, the main points for the water quality analysis. But it, uh, when we do our assessment, it's throughout the whole year as well. So we get into the analysis. This is just a picture of, you know, some biologists out there collecting water quality samples. We'll actually get on the boat, you know, with our notebook, our pens and papers, and you know, dip into the water to take samples that we'll send off to the lab for analysis. So when we were talking about that poor water quality, we said algae and turbidity. Now, what that means for the lake itself is that sometimes it's too green and sometimes it's too murky from either of those things. And uh, what we see in Airhead Pond is that it can be both too green like split pea soup, and too murky like chocolate milk. Um, one way that we measure 
this uh, water quality assessment for clarity is using this tool here, which is called a Secchi disk. The disk here is uh, connected to a measurement tape that is lowered into the water. The disk has black and white quadrants on it, and when it is lowered into the water, um, the scientist records the depth at which the black and white is no longer distinguishable between the two. So once you cannot tell between which quadrant is which, that depth is marked and it is called the Secchi depth. So that is a measure of water of clarity. And it's very useful because it can be used from lake to lake and from different times of the year. It's very um, comparable across different systems. So the tape measure and the disc will always be the same and the measurements will be comparable. All right, now looking forward to some of the data that we uh, lay out and explain a little bit more in depth in the document itself. We have this chart here. And I'm just gonna talk about the chart here before, some, before I put some data on there. Um, on the bottom axis here, the x-axis, we have the assessment period, which runs from 2002 to 2018. That's gonna be the time that we collect the data, that we form our trends and analysis, and that helps uh, determine that TMDL equation later on in the presentation. On the y-axis here, we have what are called TSI values. TSI stands for Trophic State Index. Now that's just a measure of the different productivities of different values in the lake when, when uh, addressing water quality. So that can go from zero on up um, with lower values meaning less productivity and higher values meaning higher productivity. Now when we look at, uh, we compare those across um, and compare them to water quality expectations, we have this red line here at 65 for our TSI, TSI value. Now what this red line means is it's an impairment limit. So when we're talking about water quality expectations, if our water quality data is above this line, it's uh, going to be looked at not meeting its water quality expectations. If it's below this line, then that's where we want it when we look at this data. So we have an impairment limit of 65 when we're talking about trophic state indices, um, when we're just talking about water quality anal analysis for different growing seasons. So if we put some data up there, we can see that some trends start to form. Um, I'll, start, I'll talk about these one at a time. First is the blue diamond for the trophic state index of Secchi depth. So we already talked about the Secchi disk, the Secchi depth, and how that, how that relates to water clarity. Um, higher TSI values for Secchi depth shows lower water clarity. So higher values are more murky, more algae, things like that. So as we track these blue diamonds over the course of time, we can see that at times they're above our impairment limit and at times they are below. Next up is the green diamond for the trophic state index of chlorophyll A. Um, so if we remember to our uh, you know, fifth, sixth grade science class, chlorophyll is uh, in plants. Um, in this instance, chlorophyll A is a stand-in for algae production in the lake. So if we, if we take these green diamonds and just compare them to algae in the lake, um, we see we'll actually use that for our methodology. So again, higher trophic state indices are indica indications of lower water quality expectations. So when our green, di when our green triangles are above this limit, um, that's not the best, and when they're below, that's where we would want them. And finally, we have these purple squares, which are, look, which are uh, the trophic state index for TP, or total phosphorus. So if we think of phosphorus as a nutrient for algae, um, you know, phosphorus we put on our lawns, we put on our fields and things like that as fertilizer. Those are plants. Well, algae are a type of plant too. So the more the more nutrient in the lake, the higher the possibility for algae production in the lake. So what we can see for these purple squares are they are above this impairment limit of 65 for the entire assessment period. So that's gonna be pretty important when we talk about where our uh, water quality problems are coming from and what we can do to address those. So 
those are all, these relationships are all explained much more in detail in the document itself as well. And I invite you to read that and comment. So just again, back to what is a TMDL, we already defined that as that tipping point of when a pollutant in a water body um, is not meeting its water quality standards. Um, there are several, several important parts to help us inform what that TMDL is. First, we have to have a target. You know, what are we going to be looking at as the source of pollution? And then when we talk about sources of pollution, there are different types. What are the main types, main sources of pollution? And finally, and then we can uh, look at that equation, that tipping point of just how much of our target pollutant we can have in the lake or water body before it's not meeting its water quality expectations. And then to inform uh, future implementation planning and best management practices, we can start to look at allocation of that, uh, that target pollutant to see where our time and money is best spent. So in this case, Arrowhead Pond, the target is phosphorus, as I alluded to earlier, those purple squares that were always above that impairment limit. Um, phosphorus can cause excess algae. Um, like I said, it's a nutrient, algae need nutrients. So the more nutrients there are, the possibility for algae is increased. And then uh, phosphorus itself comes to Arrowhead Pond attached to sediment. So the more sediment there is, the possibility for more phosphorus as well. And that sediment can create cloudy water, which also, cr which also can create water clarity issues. So when we look at phosphorus, it's transported by both surface runoff from different areas of land use in the watershed and also groundwater flow underneath on its way to Arrowhead Pond. Um, so what we're gonna want to do is uh, reduce the sediment from runoff into the lake to address the target of phosphorus in order to decrease algae and decrease sediment, which will hopefully improve water quality expectations. Now, if we look at different types of sources for that phosphorus in Arrowhead Pond, there are two main sources that Jeff talked about earlier, point sources and non-point sources. Point sources, again, are any of those um, things that are permitted. So we look at these as, you know, those are just fancy acronyms for municipal and industrial discharges. So let's think of cities and factories. So when we look at the sources of city and factory pollution of phosphorus to Arrowhead Pond, we can see that there are no point sources in the lake, so that will help simplify our, so our equation later on. So again, no point sources contribute phosphorus. That means that all of the uh, phosphorus coming to Arid Pond would be from non-point sources. And these are different types of non-point sources. We have row crop runoff, you know, direct deposition from pastures, grazing, grazing wildlife, um, failing septic tanks, stream bank erosion, and uh, the document lays it out in more detail, but row crop runoff is one of the main sources of phosphorus to Arrowhead Pond. So just to take a step back, we have our target of phosphorus. We have our sources, non-point. And now we can look at that equation for the TMDL or that tipping point of, you know, how many packages can that pack mule sustain and still, still walk forward? The TMDL is, again, an equation. Um, it has three main parts. The, uh, the sum of the waste load allocation, this waste load allocation, the sum of load allocations, and then a margin of safety. So when we compare these components to different sources, waste load allocation is comparable to point sources, and load allocation is comparable to non-point sources. So again, we said that uh, point sources were zero, so when we look at our equation, that will be zero, and then the rest will be non-point sources and a margin of safety. This margin of safety is there to make sure that our, our values for our different modeling things are conservative and to take into account any, any small errors and things like that. We wanna make sure that we um, err on the side of improving the water quality too much instead of too little. So when we look at the actual numbers to plug in this equation explained in the document, our waste load allocal allocation is again, zero pounds of total phosphorus per year since there are zero, non zero point sources in the watershed. And then the remainder is uh, load allocation and margin of safety. Um, our load allocation is 275.8 pounds of total phosphorus per year to the pond. 
And then the margin of safety is 30.5 pounds. So that 30.5 pounds represents a 10% margin of safety over our total TMDL value of 305.3 pounds of total phosphorus per year. Now, when we compare that to the existing phosphorus load um, that we uh, modeled from that assessment period from 2002 to 2018, the existing total phosphorus per year is uh, 1,112 pounds compared to the TMDL of 305.8. So in order to meet our water quality expectations, we're gonna have to have a, we're gonna have to see a 73% reduction of total phosphorus per year. Um, that seems insurmountable, but uh, this is a, a multi-year solution. We're not gonna, we want to see this over time. So if we reduce it a little bit each year over time, we can get to that TMDL value. This is a long-term solution to a long-term problem. We have to remember that. So looking at these uh, different values again, we have our target phosphorus, we have our sources, we just talked about the equation, and now to be useful, we also like to talk about the allocations of where total phosphorus is coming from in the Arrowhead Pond watershed. So if you look at these different sources, we have um, all these listed in the document, but the main one that we want to look at here is row crops. So row crops, the description would be um, different sheet and reel erosion from corn and soybeans, which accounts for 63% of the total um, phosphorus contributions to Arrowhead Pond. So when we look at different in implementation plans, we're going to want to highlight and address ones that can reduce erosion in row crops in situations and scenarios. So we've talked about all that. We've talked about the TMDL, the watershed. We want to look at some steps on the ground that we can actually take to improve water quality. So our implementation plan in the document talks about a list of potential solutions and best management practices. And we want to encourage local participation and also then allow for future monitoring to actually tell, are we lowering it? Are we, is it staying the same? Is it somehow getting worse? Things like that. We want to compare our uh, assessment period to a future assessment period to see what's going on. If you look at different best management practices, um, the first one that we're gonna talk about are land management practices or prevent, pre preventative BMPs. So these um, provide benefits to both soil and water quality, but more important, these are all based on the land use that uh, is in the watershed. So we talked about phosphorus being the source and we talked about runoff from row crops being the main contribution. So our examples that we look at will all be different types to reduce runoff in uh, row crop scenarios. So we have conservation tillage, cover crops, perennial strips, CRP, and then different manure and nutrient, nutrient management strategies that can reduce phosphorus going onto the uh, row crops. And here's just an example of no-till farming, which is uh, BMPs. We can see soybeans planted here in between uh, the previous year's um, corn stover. So that corn stover here um, has a couple benefits. It increases the uh, organic material in the soil, which allows more water to be held closer to the soil. And it also acts as a, almost a shield when rain falls down. If you imagine a raindrop falling and hitting the soil, it can dislodge small soil particles when it hits that soil. But if it hits a corn stalk instead, then it'll break up and the corn stalk will absorb that energy and hopefully reduce uh, erosion and runoff. If we look at uh, best management pr practices at the structural level or our mitigation, um, these also look at trying to slow down or stop um, pollutants during transport. So if that runoff and erosion starts, how do we stop it from getting to Arrowhead Pond? couple examples that address phosphorus and erosion in uh, um, row crop scenarios would be terraces, grassed waterways, sediment basins, and wetlands. So all of these look to stop the fate and transport of uh, phosphorus before it gets to the pond. Um, one example of these, you can see a sediment basin here located downstream of some pasture area and then row crop. So what happens in a storm event, this rainfall and runoff comes down here and it backs up so that water slows down and allows a chance for those soil particles, soil and phosphorus attached particles to slow down and settle out 
into this water area before it gets to the pond. So it is acting kind of as a sacrificial node here to collect um, phosphorus before it gets to the pond. And finally, we can look at uh, in-lake remediation strategies. So if that phosphorus or soil gets to the lake, what can we be doing? So this would be like fixing existing issues in the lake. Some examples of those would be different finish, fisher, fisheries management strategies, shoreline stabilization, and targeted dredging. So our document talks about fisheries management being one of the main ways that we may be able to uh, remediate phosphorus in the lake. If you can imagine rough fish like carp swimming in one of these shallow ponds, they stir up the ground, they root around, you know, they resuspend some of those soil and phosphorus particles that can create cloudy conditions. If we remove those fish from the lake, that may allow that sediment to stay at the bottom and not be resuspended. Um, targeted dredging would be more for larger lakes with uh, um, larger issues that may not be a useful in Arrowhead Pond. If we look at next steps, you know, we obviously want continued monitoring. We want to we be able to quantify if water quality expectations are improving, decreasing, staying the same, or things like that. And, you know, the key to success here is locally led effort. We want to have uh, local involvement for greater success. We need to promote awareness. Some of these ways that we can do that would be to create a watershed group, develop a watershed management plan using this document, using this water quality improvement plan, and then actually implement those water quality improvements, whether they be to prevent, mitigate, or remediate phosphorus to the lake. And then depending on resource allocations, DNR may be able to provide technical assistance to these different uh, water quality improvement plan strategies. And from there, I'm gonna kick it back to Jeff and we can talk about uh, what you guys can do to help us um, with our document. Yeah, thanks Andrew. Just wanted to reiterate the end of the public comment period is October 5th. And so if you have an official comment after you have taken a look at that document, that again is on our website, feel free to email that to me, Jeff Burkus at dnr.iowa.gov. And if you have more technical questions or just want to talk a little bit more about the presentation but don't want to make an official comment, I'd encourage you to reach out to Andrew. His contact information is on the top of this page. Thank you so much for taking the time to review this presentation and let us know if you have any comments or questions. Thank you.